Uh, good evening. Welcome to this evening's program, The Immigration and Political Crisis in Central America and the Biden Administration's Proposal to Address the Root Causes of This Migration in Search of a Better Life in his 2021 U.S. Citizenship Bill being considered by Congress. All right. Thank you all for joining us. It is our pleasure and honor to present this program for you. This evening's program is being sponsored by the Long Beach Area Peace Network, a grassroots network of community organizations and individuals who are dedicated to serving the cause of world peace at home and abroad. We also support organizations that fight for social justice, economic and environmental justice. I will put the link to our Facebook site in the chat. Please check us out and like us there. We would like to record this evening's program to be able to share it later. Do any of the presenters object to this? I don't. Thank you. I'm sorry, did you say you do or don't? I don't. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Put Joe, me. Are you? The request. Yeah, great. All right, thank you. As well. if, if there are any audience members who object, we ask that you remove yourself from the call now and watch the program later once we have posted it online. The history of U.S. involvement in Central America goes back centuries, beginning with the United States' Declaration of Manifest Destiny in 1845, and includes attempts and successes at overthrowing governments and suppressing liberation movements, economic imperialism, the stealing of land to build the Panama Canal, the support of corrupt regimes, and much, much more. Corrupt governments in Central America, supported by the Trump administration, and supported directly or indirectly by previous administrations, are causing thousands of unaccompanied children and desperate families to flee human rights abuses and poverty to seek sanctuary in the United States. President Biden is earmarking $4 billion in aid to address what he refers to as, as I said, the root causes of Central American migration. Will this money go into the pockets of the corrupt governments of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala? Will it be used to stop the corruption and human rights abuses and create employment opportunities in migrant sending, sending communities? Professors Norma Chinchia, Lauren Heidrink and Joseph Wilkberger will explore these issues and more this evening. Before we begin, we want to recognize the Tongva people whose land we are on here in Long Beach. This land was stolen by the European invaders and the Tongva people's lives and culture suffered great harm at the hands of these Europeans and later the United States. Lauren Heidrink is an anthropologist and associate professor in human development at California State University, Long Beach. She is author of Migranthood, Youth in a New Era of Deportation from Stanford University Press 2020, tracing the experiences of indigenous youth who are deported from the US and Mexico to Guatemala. She also published Migrant Youth transnational families and the state care and contested interests from Pennsylvania University Press back in 2014 on the experiences of unaccompanied children in U.S. detention facilities. She is co-founder and editor of Youth Circulations. Joseph Wiltberger is an anthropologist who is currently a fellow at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies and visiting scholar at the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at the University of California, San Diego. In his research on Central American migration, Professor Wiltberger has conducted extensive ethnographic field research in El Salvador and among transnational Central American migrants in the US and in border areas. His most recent work concerns the conjuncture of forced migration from Central America and strategies of deterrence at the US-Mexico border. Last but not least, Norma Stoltz Chinchia is Professor Emeritus in Sociology and Women's Studies at Cal State University in Long Beach, and the co-author with Nora Hamilton of the award-winning book, 
seeking community in a global city, Guatemalans and Salvadorians in Los Angeles, published by Temple University Press in 2001. She is the co-founder of the Long Beach Immigrant Rights Coalition in 2006 and is, was its executive director until September 2020. She currently serves as expert witness in asylum cases for Guatemalans and is the coordinator of the newly formed Long Beach Immigration Forum. If you are interested in knowing more about the forum or having access to the immigration information on its Facebook page, please let us know in the chat window and uh, we will let her know and you can talk to her. Um, I got excited about doing this particular topic when in the context of um, exploring the new immigration bill. I, the, the new immigration bill is a very bold bill. Uh, we haven't heard much about it yet, but it's available at the whitehouse.gov and Loretta Sanchez um, is one of the, I think she's the lead, uh, one of the leaders in Congress. And um, it has some very important parts that are kind of a wish list of things that we have hoped to accomplish over so many years. As you know, the last bill was pretty, the last bill was pretty much 2006 comprehensive and that one didn't pass. So for someone who was involved in the 1980s in the immigrant justice movement and trying to uh, get status for a large number of undocumented people from Central America and seeing the lives of those people change so dramatically once they had an access the legalization and citizenship, uh, you know, this is kind of one of my life streams is to pass this bill. But of course, it all depends on the details. So the section of the bill that I think really needs a ton of discussion is this proposed addressing the root causes of Central American migration. So we know that the big push factors are, no surprise, poverty and unemployment, violence, and corruption. Corruption itself takes a huge amount of, fuels the violence and takes a huge amount out of the economy and makes reform projects really difficult. Um, but the question would be, what could really be done and would sending $4 billion to Central America uh, make a dent or make an, a significant impact? So. I asked my two friends um, who actually have done much more work on the ground and recent work, if they would share their views with us. And then even though I haven't been on the ground and haven't done research there for many, many years, um, I do read a lot and I prepare for, for um, asylum hearings. And I did contact a couple friends in Guatemala and ask for their opinion. I respect them, they have long history. So when Joe and Lauren uh, finished kind of offering their first round, I'll, I'll, um, I'll share what I, where I started out on this question and where I ended up. Lauren, do you wanna take a stab at it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, so my name is Lauren Heidbrink. Um, I work at Cal State Long Beach, I'm an anthropologist. But before um, I became an anthropologist, I actually uh, worked in Chicago in the late 90s at a torture treatment center. And as you know, many of you know from, from the work that you've been doing, um, people were fleeing their countries from the armed conflicts um, and US intervention in the area. And so I, I, I say that to just kind of let you know that I'm coming um, at this research and at this work and at these you know, community collaborations with an intergenerational lens is really, you know, as I work with young people who are legally classified as unaccompanied, they're not really unaccompanied, which I'm happy to get into in the Q and A, um, but we have to understand the legacies of colonialism and the, and the armed conflict to really understand why young people are, are on the move in, in numbers that, that we find um, alarming um, and, and certainly that are splashed across the headlines. Um, so much of the work that I've done um, has either been in U.S. detention facilities for unaccompanied children um, or um, in Guatemala, um, as was mentioned in the intro, with primarily indigenous, so Maya mom and Maya Kiche youth who migrate um, and are deported from Mexico and from the U.S. Um, and I work primarily with indigenous youth because um, experts in, in Guatemala and, and government officials estimate anywhere from 70 to 95 percent of the migration 
from Guatemala and young people that are deported to Guatemala are indigenous. Um, now these, when you actually map out the, the last 10 years of um, where people are migrating from, you know, down to the municipality, what you see is, is actually where um, you see the more kind of spectacular forms of violence, right? Homicide rates, the, the gang activity um, is not actually where young people are coming from, right? They're coming from the highlands, which border Mexico, um, and there are other kind of structural reasons why um, they're, they're migrating at, at the rates that they are. Um, and so much of my work has been, at least over the last you know, six or seven years, following um, young people as they're deported, kind of what's their experience in these government facilities and U.S. chartered flights and, and how they um, return to military bases and then as they return to their communities and reunify with their families and then over time, you know, over over three, four or five years, what happens, right? Do they remigrate? How do they reintegrate into their communities? What are the challenges um, that they face? What are the opportunities um, that, that they take advantage of through um, institutional interventions um, that, that do exist? Um, and so, you know, I've been working in Guatemala for 20 some years now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think looking at the current Biden proposal in terms of looking at aid and, and much of what the, the legislation is saying is that they will bypass the state, you know, um, given the corruption that, that Norma mentioned um, and, um, and give this aid to nonprofit organizations, right? Um, and so, I, again, I kind of look back to history and look at, well, what did it look like in the late 1990s, right, at the end of the armed conflict, when there was this huge influx of international development aid, um, where humanitarian organizations were getting, um, you know, fistfuls of, of money to do kind of post-conflict post reconstruction. Um, and so I'm really weary. I'm really weary about one bypassing the state, you know, and I understand, you know, given the corruption, um, given the closing of the UN back CSIG um, a couple of years ago under um, Jimmy Morales, that president. Um, certainly in the last couple of weeks, the current president has um, really installed um, and stacked the, the constitutional court, which is really, at least in Guatemala, the last kind of bastion of, of, kind of checks and balances. Um, and so the, the current president has, has put his chief of staff and one of his closest advisors onto the constitutional court, which thankfully only has a five-year term, but, but still. Um, and so I think, you know, if, even if we look at our own country and look at the ways that the, the courts have been stacked, you can kind of imagine um, that, that there aren't a lot of checks and balances when it comes to corruption. Um, and so not only looking back to that kind of post post conflict reconstruction, but even looking back to 2014. Um, so I was doing research in, in Guatemala in 2014 with young people um, who were deported and and Biden made a number of trips you know, as then vice president and he was really spearheading the response that led to the southern border program, which was the securitization efforts through through Mexico on um, having Mexico um, law enforcement um, kind of apprehend and, and deport um, young people and their families um, to Guatemala. We see externalization of borders, right? So increasingly, you might have seen in the news um, uh, Guatemalan authorities stopping caravans coming through um, through Central America in spite of having um, free circulation agreements within within Central American countries under the C4. Um, and so you see the border increasingly moving south and, and that hasn't changed, right? And actually the deportation rates haven't changed under Biden and there's a few reasons for that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think looking at 2014 and looking at, you know, when Biden came and what resulted from, from his visits, um, there, there was some effort to try to tackle corruption. And I think that needs to be part and parcel of any conversation that we have um, in terms of, of this, this particular package of, of aid. Um, but I am very weary of, of um, kind of handing the, these funds over to, to NGOs um, in part because there's also corruption within the NGOs. You know, in Guatemala, they call it onihismo, this idea that, you know, people have their little kind of fiefdoms um, and, and um, take that development aid and, and don't necessarily serve or don't actually work in the areas where, where people are migrating from. So again, most are kind of headquartered in Guatemala City. Um, so, just to kind of share one one experience, um, when in 2014, when Biden had been had recently been uh, visited Guatemala, um, I went into a nonprofit organization that got the biggest contract um, to respond to young people um, that were being deported and try to create alternatives to migration. Um, and you know, and it's this it's huge NGO. It's you know down the down the hill from um, the U.S. embassy. Um, uh, 
you know, I, I come in and there's, you know, um, brown, you know, plush leather chairs and this beautiful balcony. It's a really well-resourced NGO. The secretary hands me 10 pages front and back of quotes from the executive, um, the CEO of the NGO that I'm about to meet with, the head of the NGO, you know, of, of where he'd been quoted in the news. And I came to find out in my interview, he had never met an unaccompanied child before, right? This is not the work that they were doing, but he was sitting at the table and he was informing decision makers and he was representing the NGO community in Guatemala. And so, you know, this time and again, right, the voices that are, the, the people that are sitting at the table are not necessarily the ones that are most affected or not necessarily the ones that are doing the work. Um, and so, you know, I think aid is a vehicle, whether it's to the state that is corrupt or to the NGOs that, you know, are, are these kind of neoliberal actors that have these neo-colonial relationships, um, you know, it, it makes me weary. Um, and, and so I think part of what I, I would love to see in the conversation, and, you know, maybe it's, it's too far-fetched, but this idea of, you um, of reparations, right? And so the argument has made has been made that you know providing legal status for Central Americans that are arriving um, in the U.S. is a form of reparations, right? Not only discrimination that they confronted in the 80s and 90s with you know the American Baptist Church litigation and and with Nicara, um, but also thinking about ways in which there are um, kind of networks already in place in terms of ancestral authorities or the Cocode in Guatemala or indigenous councils that could be used as vehicles to, that, that understand the needs of the community and better provide and respond to the needs um, of, of people that are, that are migrating. But I think that also, whether you use that mechanism or, or NGOs, I think making the state accountable is, is an important um, conversation that we need to have. And I think kind of dangling development aid um, hasn't worked in the past, right? It hasn't worked in the last 20 years, so I'm not particularly hopeful that it's going to work now. Um, and then I'd say just the, the last thing to add is, you know, I think that there's some low-hanging fruit um, that the Biden administration could enact, you know, so thinking about TPS, temporary protected status, I think that would be a starting place. You know, they've, they've enacted it for Venezuelans, um, and the idea that, um, you know, this is a policy-made crisis, and so I think enacting TPS would allow us to kind of thoughtfully consider and respond to, um, you know, the, the quote-unquote root causes, right, that go back generations. Um, I think having, you know, a single bill trying to address these issues that the Biden, Biden himself has failed and, and previous administrations had failed multiple times, um, you know, I think we need a much more kind of thoughtful, um, nuanced, informed, um, policy if we're really going to think about um, addressing the reasons why why people are, are migrating. So maybe I'll stop there and, and turn it over to Joe. I'm, I'm an anthropologist as well. And uh, I, I, my work has been focusing on El Salvador. I, I started out there um, in 1999. I was, I was a, still a kid. And um, I, was, I, I got involved with teaching and doing youth work in a community that uh, was really was really at the heart of the war, the Civil War, and um, really was very fresh off of the, you could, you could still sense the war was in the air. It was really, it was really still present in everyone's life. And, and I just observed and, and was part of this community and saw all these young people leaving and just every student I had left except for two of a hundred students. I mean, everyone was going to the United States and it was, it was very interesting to me and it's actually kind of what led me down this path to to anthropology and to wanting to do research um, about this and um, you know, a long time ago as an undergraduate and then later as a graduate student. So I started going and checking out the migrant trails and, and, and kept my research very focused in this community and rooted there. And my dissertation work really looked at kind of what, um, how people envisioned and imagined alternatives to undocumented immigration from these communities. And um, and what that could look like. And what I, what I learned or what I found out really was that it often looks a lot different to them than um, the sort of state uh, and multilateral um, organizations approaches to instituting um, development, economic development according to very conventional rubrics. So the, the talk then was very much about remittances and how you know, the money that, that migrants are sending back could be used to slow migration but there, I had a lot of critiques about um, about, about that because it, people were using remit, their remittances and their finances in very creative ways. Uh, they had a sense of well-being and, and, and of, of kind of a buen vivir that um, looked a lot different than 
the the financial education that uh, the big NGOs and the multilaterals and the state were trying to sort of impose on them as this new discussion really at the time of, you know, alternatives to migration as part of a, a state discourse really was emerging then um, with a lot more prominence as the government turned leftward. So I, I've, I've kind of been following that thread um, throughout my research since then. And of course, now there's a lot more attention to these issues we're discussing violence and corruption and gangs and, um, you know, the forces that, that drive migration today that are all, again, historically rooted in colonial inequalities and these terrible conflicts that were raging in the region and um, systemic inequalities. Um, and, and it's really important we don't, well, we don't forget that uh, as we look at forward looking quote solutions um, to address these underlying issues. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting to see uh, Biden talk about addressing root causes of migration as part of a comprehensive immigration reform uh, bill. Um, I think it's in some ways it's very novel um, to, to be looking in this way. And I think a lot of it is, is really is really coming from a very present focus of, of the, the fear and of, 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 of what's going on at our border. Um, and, and it's been kind of a disproportionate attention actually directed to Central America. Um, caravans and the, the, the arrival of unaccompanied minors and, and, and families in 2014 um, that you know, got treated as a surge. Uh, the recent talk just in the last few weeks that more and more people are again showing up um, and what that, you know, how that poses kind of a, a, you know, a scare or a threat or a concern or a crisis or a challenge, whatever, whatever words they want to employ. So I want to just start by um, reminding us with a little bit of caution that it's, it's not all about Central America. And it, I, I always find it kind of peculiar that uh, the discourse continues to be directed toward, um, toward that region and those families. Having said that, I think it's very interesting that that there's this um, this talk about really going to the root causes. Um, when we look at root causes, we know that the asylum system does not recognize the complex overlapping uh, multiple reasons and historical roots that f force these these folks to flee their communities. Right? These putting people in a very neat categories that our legal system establishes just fails. It fails to to look at how systemic, you know, um, corruption overlaps with severe drought in the last several years. It's tied to climate change, which gets worsened when your community gets flooded from two major hurricanes that happened um, just last year that no one talked about because we were too busy talking about the election uh, and saw billions of dollars in damage and hundreds of thousands displaced. Um, and those folks get treated as economic migrants, not as valid, you know, validated asylum seekers when they actually, if they are ever able to, to reach those courts. So I think it's very important that um, that we also recognize that uh, there really is a need for a really much more nuanced and up-to-date understanding of these root causes, right? And, and putting them into historical context as well. And, and I don't think our, our legal system is capable of ever, of ever really doing that. So if we turn to NGOs and to, to governments in El, in, in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras and this region and, and think about what they can do or how the US can be involved in, in addressing those issues, um, it's a it's a really challenging complex task that um, that's really um, really hard to really hard to do, <laughs> uh, as Lauren was pointing out. Um, I think back to Biden's support uh, and really spearheading um, the Alliance for Prosperity, which was initially started with seven hundred fifty million dollars in aid. It was designed by political elites and uh, in conjunction with the, the IADB. And it really supported the interests of political elites in these countries and, and big businesses and transnational corporations. There was a lot of uh, tax reform and, and support for free trade and you know, creating jobs that way um, for uh, security. And if you support the security forces in El Salvador, we're talking about extrajudicial murder of, um, of, of folks, uh, suspected gang members in their own communities. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, support for anti-corruption task force in, in, in Honduras that have completely failed as the president is now um, you know, found to be involved, as whole family's involved with, with narco-trafficking. Um, the Alliance for Prosperity had a very small fraction, really, that went to these NGOs and to grassroots organizations and local organizations that are working on the ground, some not so much, as, as Lauren pointed out. Um, I think 
Lauren's critique of, of the NGO industry is something to be really aware of. And just living in El Salvador for many years and, and being in those conversations with these organizations and with the state and with these multilaterals and went to a lot of different forums and workshops and discussions and talks and, and planning sessions. And it really is a big business. It's a really big business. And when you start dangling $4 billion, it's a, it's, it's a money grab. It's, it's a lot of competition for, um, for what's going out there. And what that means is the money gets misappropriated and doesn't go, it, it really doesn't reach the folks that are in need in the ways that it would be the most productive, right? So how can we change that? Like how, how could that be actually be addressed? I think it's really interesting to learn that Biden is talking about bypassing the state altogether. Um, in some ways, there, I mean, in some ways that could create a lot of distrust, a lot of issues. If you're trying to create an anti-corruption task force um, or reform a court system that is systemically corrupt, you need to be working with the state and you want state actors on your side. Um, and you need to be able to have genuine conversations and hold them accountable. But that requires a lot more on the ground, nuanced, um, uh, contextual, uh, genuine um, relationships and understandings um, with local communities, with activists, with the state, with um, NGOs. I think it has to involve a conversation with a broad range of actors and not just be a drop money and watch the big NGOs parachute in and count a bunch of numbers and say, we helped 4,000 people and stopped all these people from migrating. <laughs> Um, and that's a success, right? And I'm wary because it, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear this proposal about bypassing the state and working with international organizations, but yet on Biden's website in the campaign, it said, giving aid to Central America is great, not just for them, because we'll slow migration, but because it'll support US business interests. So there was kind of a very transparent way of putting out there that the same kind of framework that's, that was really behind the Alliance for Prosperity might be really um, the same kind of framework going forward. And I want to I would really like to draw attention to the importance of um, not following the exact same pattern as before. Um, I think there are some NGOs that are doing an excellent work. They've been working there. They have a track record of working there for generations. I was um, in Honduras two years ago and I was in meetings with LGBTI activist organizations who were saying, I'm sorry, we have a really important meeting about trying to get our USAID funding back. We need this, right? And they were doing the hard work on the ground. I know folks who are working at um, Catholic Relief Services in El Salvador that have gotten millions of dollars, but they are tracking every, um, you know, they're tracking exactly what they're doing in a very transparent way. And they've done some really interesting violence prevention work in some of the most marginalized areas. Um, and it's, they can show that it's been very successful in many ways. Um, and I've seen the polar opposite too of, um, Washington DC based consulting firms that get the contract, the big contract, they get $20 million, they parachute in and they don't, they don't even speak Spanish and they don't even know what's going on. Um, they don't know anything about the local context. Uh, and they're talking about violence prevention and they're using terms on their website like, you know, Pedro learned to play the guitar and, you know, he was prone to being a gang member based on the community he was in. And he's so lucky he got counseling and his family learned to, you know, support him. Well, these traditional approaches to preventing gang violence that might work in a U.S. community where there's actual policing and support and there's community-based um, uh, organizations and there's, there's, a, you know, there's ways to work with families is much different than preventing gang violence in an area where a lot, often it's, it, it's, it's through forced recruitment and, and uh, the police are, are collaborating with gangs, right? So there really is a need for on the ground, um, nuanced, contextualized uh, work with the communities, the leaders, uh, the activists, the organizations, um, and the state uh, who, are really, um, who are really able to try to tackle these problems because they've been working on it for many, many years and uh, they have the knowledge to begin to try to, to address these really, really hard problems. Um, so I'll, I'll leave off there. I, uh, I really appreciate both of you. Uh, I knew that it would be really rich and, and experience-based and, and uh, in-depth. And I would like to say that, first of all, the reason I got kind of excited about this part of the bill uh, is I like to think of myself as a, you know, after you've been 
a leftist activist for so many decades, you kind of, well, not everybody, some people become just more hardline ideological, but people like me uh, really like to uh, think of themselves as actually seeing what can work, what can actually make a difference. Even if you can't achieve your utopian goals, um, it would be nice to see some material objective improvement in people's lives. And I have at moments seen that, for instance, with IRCA, with the Immigration Reform Act in the 1980s. Yes, people were left out of IRCA, many people, but I saw such difference. So it, it isn't the be all and end all. It didn't solve the problem for the larger problem, but it, it was a big achievement. Um, so I guess I was excited because they were even talking about anti-corruption supporting anti-corruption efforts rather than funding the, the corruption or funding the people carrying out the corruption. And I was excited because I thought, um, you know, that it seemed like it was kind of a new wave. Uh, and then I started looking at Washington office on Latin America, who I respect very much. And they seem to be very much on board with this. Uh, it looks to me like it comes out of a cons uh, work uh, of what has happened recently in Honduras, where there was in fact, there were in fact these strong civil society groups fighting it for democracy, fighting against corruption. They called in the, uh, they asked for the support of the OAS. There was something established. And then of course the government and the elites put pushed back and it looks to me like they pretty much destroyed that. But it, it I got the sense that maybe this push was coming out of that experience, that recent experience that somehow US diplomacy and US aid could be aligned with those civil society demands. But when I talked to my friend from Guatemala today, and like I say, she has a lifelong history of being in the revolutionary movement, now being part of you know civil society groups, um, helping nonprofits, writing grants for nonprofits, reviewing grants for nonprofits, working with the Europeans in the donations that they give to groups. Um, she said, Norma, let's be real. Um, they've just finished destroying pretty much the main partners that would be the partners necessary for an anti-corruption campaign in, in uh, Guatemala. Uh, the U.S. stood by while the, the commission that was sponsored by the U.N. that had managed to achieve help local forces and the courts and the attorneys achieve those the genocide trial and actually put some people in in prison for for their role in the massacres and a couple of convictions of drug trafficking. Um, that you know they stood by while while the recent government was able to shut down the commission. And at this point, she said, look, uh, aside from the corruption, the narco traffickers control territory and the majority of the territory and the majority of politics. So what we did agree on was that um, a successful campaign against corruption takes 10 to 15 years, which, which is what it took in Guatemala. And so maybe we could plant the seeds or, or there could be policies that would plant the seeds towards that, but it certainly doesn't fit within a four year term. And um, I think when I started thinking about it, uh, the Obama government really didn't have reformers in foreign policy as far as I'm concerned. It was pretty hawkish and pretty um, Cold War-ish and uh, spent a lot of time talking about Venezuela, you know, and not much, and pretty much uh, supported the defeat of the populist and leftist governments that came to power. And, and, and what my friend was talking about was, because she's involved in an effort to a small political party that is attempting to gain more influence and power, but she said, the forces are really against us at this point. Um, you would need, both state allies, and that's what Joe and Lauren mentioned, that you need the courts. You need somebody in the courts and you need somebody in the, in, you know, the attorney general on your side, like you had in Guatemala for a while, uh, this extraordinary woman, Claudia Pasipas, just, you know, a saint. 
someone who definitely needs to be canonized, but just so courageous and people around her and other groups. So it isn't that it cannot happen. Uh, it definitely should happen, but I do basically agree at the end of the day that um, it would have to be very well thought out and we would have to be very vigilant. And I think we would really have to push hard um, if we wanted to have any influence on this uh, and raise a lot of questions.